there, we're the Americans uh, here in Los Angeles, California, and uh, wishing we were there with you in beautiful Morocco. Uh, that was our plan this summer, but as you well know, uh, almost everyone's plans have been derailed uh, as of late. So um, we're going to do something we've never done before, where we're going to uh, do a bit of this program we've been playing around the world, um, but we'll do it just like everything these days, uh, virtually. We are a uh, rock band, we write and play our own music, but before we ever started doing that, uh, we were, we got together playing uh, what we call here in America's old time music, meaning uh, traditional American music, uh, you know, in a sense back before um, the, the modern age of music. Uh, we're going to basically do a very short version of what we've been doing in various countries uh, and try to play a survey for you of a bunch of different styles that existed um, around the United States and had a lot to do with all the various immigrants who came to the United States uh, in different times. Uh, the reason this, this particular period is so fascinating in American music is that it was uh, not long after the ability to record sound was invented. Uh, and so as a result, it was a kind of like uh, catching a, uh, an unknown species in the wild or something. There are all these different types of music uh, that had never really seen the light of day because they'd never been preserved. They were just handed down by tradition. And uh, in a moment's time, uh, we picked them all up and uh, committed them to disc, and then they were uh, never to be the same after that. Uh, so, what was this world like? I think we'll start with a uh, song from the uh, American countryside. Uh, this is a standard dance number um, back when rural dancing was sort of a community staple. Uh, this is a song called Sally Good. <laughs> Simultaneously playing for a bunch of people watching, we can't see. Uh, at least, you know, it's not doing stand-up comedy because that's probably that's probably not going to work in this medium. At least, not not for a while. So, you know, while Zach's holding this banjo here, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about this instrument's history because it's just such a good metaphor and example 
for American music as a whole and the sort of uh, ramshackle and diverse way it came together to form um, what, you know, uh, you know, the engine of popular music. Um, we can learn a lot about American music from the banjo's journey uh, to and then within the United States. With, with no exact standard for how to build this instrument, it assumed many forms and styles. The way that it originated was uh, in uh, countries in Africa, in you know various forms, coming over aboard slave ships. And uh, once it got to America and dispersed around the country, uh, with no kind of template for what it should be, it, it became sort of whatever people wanted it to be. There were long banjos with gut strings and no frets, uh, banjos with four strings, banjos with five strings. Um, Essentially, the banjo became nearly as diverse uh, as the musicians who, uh, who used it and the purposes for which it was used. Uh, so just as the music industry would later standardize and homogenize uh, all sorts of different folk music styles into popular forms, the banjo eventually became associated with just one style known as uh, bluegrass. So Zach's just going to play you um, an example now of like the you know, sort of early uh, forms of the banjo. It's called a claw hammer style, a real old style here. strumming a little more picking. Where would you have heard this? I mean, what was the relationship between this and the last one? Uh, that, that last style, um, gosh, it, it's just, uh, I guess it's just one of the real older banjo styles. Uh, and th th this is something that kind of developed a little bit later. Just a stepping stone along the way. Yeah, stepping stone along the way. I guess this is kind of associated with the Appalachian Mountains. It's sort of this tuning also, it's a different tuning. That, it's kind of a half minor tuning. They call it a modal or sometimes it's called sawmill tuning. here at the fifth fret and it's higher than, than all the other strings. It creates a lot of really interesting syncopated rhythms. No matter what style you're doing, it always kind of rings out. And yeah, as, as the banjo is uh, essentially the, uh, the only uh, African instrument to have entered popular music in America, uh, it brought with it a really important characteristic of, uh, of a fair number of styles of African music, which is drone. So the, basically that string is yeah. a drone string, and that's what makes it so different sounding from other instruments, is that string is, is not, you don't it's, ever, it's, it's not as often changed, the note stays the same. Yeah, you don't, usually, uh, you don't usually fret it down the way you would these, this one, it's like a harp, you know, you just pluck it. Like. So uh, Zach and Jake are going to play uh, a song now uh, to illustrate that final genre that I'm, I'm sure you've at least heard the name of called Bluegrass Music, named after a region in uh, the state of Kentucky in the United States. And uh, this was, uh, d despite how we kind of look at that uh, that genre now, bluegrass was uh, bluegrass is a fairly new invention. It came actually as a result of modernization of a bunch of different kinds of American uh, folk music, and it essentially crystallized what the banjo has been ever since. This is what people think of now when they think of the banjo as a result of bluegrass. So they'll play a moment of a bluegrass tune. So we're gonna do a foggy mountain breakdown here.
so the, the point that I'm trying to make here as to why it's so important uh, to draw a line between this previous kind of music and the kind of music we listen to today um, is that I really think it, it, it basically characterizes everything about music, where it comes from. So it, if you imagine a world before recorded sound, when basically all the music you heard was performed live, there just didn't exist, you know, there was no listening to music on your phone or on the internet, there were no CDs, there were no records, no cassette tapes, there just was no way to hear anybody who wasn't playing right before you. It severely limited the ability of anyone to uh, have a whole lot of reach. The only way you could have reach in terms of writing songs was to publish printed sheet music, um, which would only, of course, approximate uh, what you were, what, the way that you would play it yourself and in your own traditions. And uh, so, you know, musicians like us, you know, we, if you play in a, in, a, in a band like ours, people often ask you, you know, what are, what are your uh, influences? And that's not a question that would make a whole lot of sense to ask somebody 150 years ago in America, because if you're living in a rural community 150 years ago, your influences are set in stone. They're the, the musicians around you, perhaps a traveling band that comes through town that you get to see, or maybe you travel and you pick up a few things. But even then, uh, you're, you're, what, what we're watching is the evolution of music, um, not unlike almost everything else in the world, happening at a much slower uh, form. It was basically a molasses compared to now when someone in China can record a song and it can become a, a dance hit um, you know, uh, a week later around the entire world. One of the more famous influences in American music is Scots Irish tradition. And um, when this music was being passed down by hand, generation after generation, uh, it's, there's a surprising amount of, of old fashioned traits and things that were um, preserved. And so this song is in the style of a song uh, that preceded it by hundreds of years. Basically, it's a, a type of song called a murder ballad, which was a sort of cautionary tale or kind of a, a newspaper journalistic story that was always very kind of dark and gloomy and dramatic. Uh, about some kind of you know terrible deed that had been done, um, but it was usually written back in the day when that sort of thing sold. And this is actually a song written in North Carolina about an actual event uh, there, but written entirely in the uh, in the style that preceded it back in the British Isles. Uh, the song is called Only Wise. <laughs>
suppose I should mention before I go, before we go any further here, that uh, the uh, the whole reason this is possible is thanks to the uh, U.S. Embassy uh, in Morocco. So thank you to the U.S. Embassy and to all the consulates there, and uh, thank you to all of you uh, watching, wherever you're from, Morocco or anywhere else around the world. Uh, we're here to wish you a happy Fourth of July. Um, whether you celebrate that or not, hope you have a happy one. Um, this next tune here is a, uh, a cowboy song from the American West. Much differently than we do now. We uh, actually, you know, let me play that one too. Yeah. Um, and we, we, you know, now looking back retrospectively, we call this country blues. Um, if we had more time, uh, as uh, I hope we will when we finally make it all the way to you in Morocco, um, we'll uh, we'll have the opportunity to delve far, far into this subject because, uh, as it happens, uh, you know, blues being a, uh, a style of music. Uh, from, made by black Americans and invented by black Americans. Uh, it's in the company of, of some of the most influential genres of music you ever created on, uh, on earth. So there's a lot to talk about, but for now, I'll just give you a taste of this. This is a, a style of country blues from the uh, 1920s and 1930s uh, in the United States.
have time for just one more song, and uh, so that's just what we'll do. Thank you all so much for uh, tuning in and listening to us. Uh, we're the Americans again from here in Los Angeles, and hope to be over there soon playing for you in person. Um, but either way, I hope you all are uh, staying safe, and I hope you're having a great 4th of July wherever you are.